you may wonder why there are fewer of us here. The youth are in Tomoka Park for their annual camping, and some parents are also there and sponsors. They will be watching us through the archive. So we are praying that they will have good weather and they will be blessed by the Lord while they are there. And uh, we have many guests. I will not be saying this after, but uh, there's a uh, maybe six tables that are for our guests. So if you are here for the first time or second time, or you have somebody who visits us or you, bring them to the guest area because uh, there's a group of our members who will gladly minister to our guests. But everybody is invited to stay for lunch because the food for everyone is as delicious as the food for the guests. And uh, we just want to let you know that we are happy you're with us. I would like to specially mention my friend, uh, Pastor Adilbert Rosana, and his wife, uh, Feli, from North, Northern Luzon Adventist College in Artatso, Pangasinan. Uh, we were together in uh, Naga View way back, maybe around 40 years ago. And his son is with them. I recognize Pastor Keith from Solid Rock and his wife. Thank you for visiting us. We hope we can visit your church one of these days. And I recognize uh, Julie. She was away for quite some time, but when she came back, she's bringing her husband with, with her. Julie, can you stand with your husband? They're from Michigan. Thank you. And uh, we are happy as a church family to have everyone because this is uh, a place for all of us. The name is Filipino, but you look around, it's not necessarily Filipinos. It's from all walks of life and from different countries of the world. Everybody is welcome because our God is the God of everyone. And we love to worship the Lord with, we have around 22 countries represented now in this church. And if some of you will join us, there will be more. Our theme for this month is stewardship. And you will notice that uh, we don't just talk about money when it comes to stewardship. The elders met and recommended that we will study more the basic foundation of our faith. And so, this is the first of the series, and because it's stewardship, I would like to touch on a different aspect of stewardship. And when you read the title, The Object of God's Supreme Regard, what comes to your mind? It's the church. And so the church is God's gift to us. We are His stewards. And so we have to do our best with the gift that God has entrusted to us. Shall we pray? Our gracious, mighty God, You're the head of the church and we are the body. Jesus is the cornerstone, and we are the building. Jesus is the groom, in the church is your bride. You place so much value and importance to your church. Sometimes we take it for granted. Teach us today, Lord, how we regard your church the way you want us to prioritize and to give significance 
to the body to whom you give your life and the group that you will be ushering into your heavenly kingdom soon. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. What occasions or what places do you usually hear the word steward? Aside from the church, when you board the plane, how do you call those who assist? Steward and stewardesses. Are they the owners? No. What are the role as they are there in the plane? To serve and to take care of the needs of those that are there. In the ship, they also have stewards, right? Those of you who go for a cruise, Orlando or Florida is known as the, or the, the starting point of cruises. And you have stewards and stewardesses attending to our needs. But stewards and stewardesses, are they so concerned about where the ship is going? Or the plane is going? If the airline is seemingly going bankrupt, are the stewards and the stewardesses spend sleepless nights? Is that their concern? No. The owner takes care of the direction of the company. The owner takes care of the upkeep. The stewards are tasked with managing and helping those that are there. So, being stewards of the church, there are times when we are so worried where the church is going. There are times when we think that the church is about to fall. There are times when others tell us that we are on the wrong course. Are the stewards given the task to address and to solve such problem? No, the owner. And in this case, the church, the owner is God, and the pilot is who? Oh, Jesus, save your pilot me. And while we are in the church, let's be faithful to the task that God has assigned to us because He will take care of the church. It's His church, and we are His stewards. Let's go to the text that we have for today. Let me try if uh, this will work. Yeah, just, just help me go to the next slide. Okay, let's read as a whole. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the way which he dedicated for us a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a great priest over the house of God, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love, in good works, let's see, not forsaking our own assembling together as the custom of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day drawing nigh. At the start of these verses, uh, by the way, uh, I have printed some materials if you are interested, some of our deacons will help uh, say that when you go home, you can still review some of what we study. In the first part of those verses, you can go, go back to the first slide, to the second slide, please. Okay, this is working now. It talks about the priest. Over the house of God. It talks about the holy place. 
it talks about the veil. It gives us, it brings our thoughts to the ministry of the sanctuary. By the way, we invite you because we, every Wednesday night, we have this series about the sanctuary. And uh, those of us that are attending are blessed. So we invite you to join us. Say, for example, I'm an Amorite. Now, an Amorite is one of those uh, tribes uh, in Canaan or those that surrounded Israel. And as he walked, he saw the camp of Israel and he saw a beautiful building with a court. And so he talked with one of the Israelites and said, What is that? And then an Israelite said, That's the sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? Tell me more about the sanctuary. He says, the sanctuary is where you find the presence of the Lord. Oh, I want to be there. Oh, no. You cannot. Why? I want to be in the presence of the Lord. He said, you should be an Israelite. Oh, man. Okay. If I become an Israelite, can I go now inside? No, 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 no. You must be a Levite. So, if I can be a Levite, I can now make it. I said, no, no, no. You must be a priest. So, if I'm a priest, I can go inside now to the presence of the Lord. He said, no, you should be the high priest. So he's already scratching his head. Uh, an Israelite, a Levite, a priest, I should be a high priest. Okay, if now I'm a high priest, can I go in now? No, only once a year. You know, the situation in the Old Testament was somewhat restrictive for a purpose. If you want to know why, you attend the midweek prayer meeting. But, according to this text in Hebrews, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place, now you don't need to be an Israelite, you don't need to be a Levite, you don't have to be a priest. We have a high priest there in the person of Jesus Christ. Anytime we want to be in the presence of the Lord, Jesus will assist us because He sanctifies us, He washes us, and He intercedes before us 24-7. Anytime you want to come, into the presence of the Lord, we can come boldly. Praise the Lord. It means that we don't just come to church to meet the Lord. To be in the presence of the Lord, you don't have to wait until Sabbath. You don't have to wait until evening. Every time we have an access into the holy throne of grace because Jesus is there interceding for us. But, he says, it talks about last days. Do you notice the verses? Uh, can you help me out again? It goes back, but uh, it does not go forward. Can you... Move it to the third one, the third slide. Okay. Do you notice what is mentioned there? As the day drawing nigh. It talks about the coming of the Lord. It talks about the end of the world. And this is talking about 
considering one another to provoke unto love in good works, forsaking our own assembling together as the custom of some, but exhorting one another. It talks about the church. At first, Apostle Paul established that it is through Jesus Christ that we gain access before the presence of the Lord. That we have salvation, that we have relationship, that we are being prepared for His kingdom. But, He uses an agency. He implements an institution in preparing us, especially now that we are in the last days. It talks about one another. It talks about assembling together. It talks about exhorting one another. Is not that the function of the church? If you are alone by yourself, can you ex exhort one another? If you say, I have Jesus in my life, I don't need a church. No, the Lord says, don't forsake the assembly. And as you see the signs of the times, when you see that it is past approaching, the more we have to be enthusiastic, you have to long for it, you have to be excited for the assembly of the saints so that we can provoke each other. It seems like the word provoke is negative, but not at all times. When you provoke, it means you cause somebody. You say, he provoked me. It means he was the one who caused me to do this. And the Lord says, it's okay to provoke each other, but provoke each other in what? In love and unto good works. That's the function of the church. And so, now that we have established the fact that Apostle Paul was saying, Jesus is our only way to the Father, but the church is His instrument in holding us together, especially in the last days. I want to move on to the next uh, slide, because here, uh, the servant of the Lord portrayed the function of the church. Can you move the, the slide? Yes. Next. It says, the church is God's fortress. Let me have the, uh, the uh, if it's not there. Those of you who have this, uh, this uh, guide. The church is God's fortress, the city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. This is so important. How the Lord pictures how he value the church. He said, any betrayal of the church is what? Treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his begotten son. Next slide, please. From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they live. He has sent forth his angels to minister to his church. And the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Through centuries of persecution, conflict, and darkness, God has sustained his church. Sometimes we are so worried. Sometimes we think the church is failing. But the Lord says, he has always sustained his people. And... Uh, it says, all has taken place, no, not one cloud has fallen upon it that has not prepared him for one opposing force's recent counterwork, his work that he has not foreseen. 
all has taken place as he predicted. He has not left his church forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations that would occur and that which the Spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. All his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with his throne and no power of evil can destroy it. Truth is inspired and guarded by God and it will triumph over all opposition. The last uh, part, during ages of spiritual darkness, the church of God has been a city set upon a hill. From age to age, through successive generations, the pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. In fabled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows, in a special sense, His supreme regard. It is the theater of His grace in which He delights to reveal His power to transform hearts. Oh, what of a privilege eh, that we are entrusted with this church. I look back since I was a child. The church has been a place that I look forward to. Growing up as a small boy, my parents brought me to this church. I love to sing those Sabbath school songs, going out on Sabbath school afternoon for brunch Sabbath schools. I look forward to memorizing my memory verse. And it was in that small church somewhere in Bicol where I was taught how to pray at the front. My knees were trembling. It's the church who molded us. It's Jesus who is behind all of this, but He is using the church. Imagine if there was no church like we had. Oh, the church molded us as young people. God, through His mercy, established schools, hospitals, Cost people to write books. Oh, the church has been a great blessing. And it is His gift to you and me. Yes, there were times when some of the leaders are not doing as God expected. There are times when we don't agree with everything they decide. But it does not mean that God is not there. It does not mean that God is not in control. You remember when uh, in 1888, the uh, Minneapolis Conference, when Kellogg, uh, uh, when A.T. Jones and Wagner presented the teachings about Righteousness by faith. The whole session turned it down. And the, the servant of the Lord was telling them, no, this is the voice of the Lord. What did he do to the servant of the Lord, Ellen White? They voted to send her to Australia to silence her. Did God tell Ellen White, Time to leave this hard-headed people. No, she even followed. She obeyed, even though she knows that this is not what God wants them to do. Because in His own time, in His own way, God directs His people so that some mistakes and some failures can be corrected. In His mighty way, he is in charge of his church. In feeble or defective that needs to be reproved, warned, and counseled, yes, anything that is handled by men is not perfect. But even though, he says, it is the only object upon earth, upon earth, which Christ bestows His supreme regard. That's why if you speak against His church, 
if you express sentiments against his church, he said, it's a betrayal because he paid through his blood for the church. Let's move on. I'm not a member of the church just because I am being paid as a pastor. This church is not just one among so many. Because if we go back to the Bible, our church was born out of the prophecy in Revelation. We have so many churches in the past, counted so many. God does not need to establish another one like the same or of the same nature. But it says our church had a prophetic roots. Why? I will not be reading everything because I want and I wish that when you go home, you read all these chapters because our study is not complete here. The continuation will be at your home when you take your Bibles and go. What is the prophetic roots of our church? Revelation 10. Remember the little scroll? The little book in Revelation 10? The angel was holding a little book and he said to John, Take it. Eat it. What will happen? In your mouth, it will be so sweet like honey. But when it gets into your tummy, it will become so bitter. What does it talk about when it comes to history? That is, the little book is about the prophecy of the end time. They were studying with excitement the 2,300 days prophecy, and there was a full revival in America and other places of the world. By studying the 2,300 years prophecy, they thought, and they fully believe that Jesus was about to come, 1844, and that will be the end of the world. 500,000 of the Millerites or the early Adventists were all gathered, waiting for the Lord to come. October what? 22, 1844. But when it reached their tummy, what happened? It was so bitter. You know how it happened? They were all praying. They were singing. Midnight came. They were looking at the sky. They thought that uh, at midnight, there will be a small, bright uh, cloud that will appear in the east. I've been there in that ascension rock where they were gathered. Past midnight, until the morning, nothing came. Nothing happened. And so those uh, members of other churches and those neighbors whom they said, Bye-bye. <laughs> Jesus will take us home today, uh, th tonight. And the following morning, those uh, accusers, those that are uh, mockers, they said, Why are you still here? I thought the world will end and you will be in heaven by now. You just realize how hard and how bitter the experience was. And according to Revelation chapter 10, after they experienced that bitter experience, they have gone through that, the Lord said, prophesy again. That's where the small group coming from that ridiculed, discouraged sometimes, but they kept on studying the scriptures and praying. That's where the Lord led a small group. And then a light was shown through the vision of God's servant that this small group guided by the light, as long as they focus on Jesus, this group will be ushered into the kingdom of the Lord. That small group 
has gone worldwide. The small group has been established. The small group has established hospitals, schools. It has covered the whole world. Are you not happy to be part of this growing church? And the Lord says, it will go through some tough times, but the Lord's hand will be in it. Next, aside from the prophetic roots, as we have a prophetic identity. In Revelation 12, 17, it talks about the remnant keeping the commandments of God and the testimonies of Jesus. We have this identity. Because most of denominations during the time were saying, we are saved by grace. Yes, we're saved by grace. But it does not mean that we are saved by grace and we receive it by faith that we neglect the law. Apostle Paul said, you don't continue to sin or disobey the law so that grace will abound. This group of people pictured here as the remnant are keeping the commandments of God not to be saved because salvation is in Jesus through grace by faith. But Keeping the commandments are God's safeguard so that we will not go back to the slavery of sin. The law of God is God's guideline so that we will be living as Christians, growing in the faith. And the second identity is they have the testimony of Jesus, which means in chapter 19 that we have the spirit of prophecy. We will talk about that sometime later uh, in the year. But are we not happy that the Lord has given us the church and yet gifted the church with somebody who can guide us to know the truth and to know things that we need to do as we prepare for the second coming? Let's move on. The third is, this church has not only a prophetic root, it's not only having a prophetic identity, but it has the prophetic message. It says in chapter 14 that this group will be preaching the everlasting gospel. The gospel that we preach as a church does not only start with the New Testament. From the very start, the gospel is that it's the grace of God that makes us acceptable before the Lord. From Eden until the last person on earth, it's all through the grace of the Lord that we will find acceptance in the throne of God. And in that context of grace, we preach about fearing God. It means reverence to Him. And if we uh, have that fear and reverence to Him. He says, God, fear God and give glory to Him. And in, in uh, Ecclesiastes, he said, fearing God and keep His commandments. You, you tell your children, you don't fear me anymore. What does it mean? You're not obeying me. When we have that holy respect and fear of God, it follows that whatever His will is, we are ready to follow. And we have that message to worship the Creator. That's why the Sabbath is part of the message. It's because that's the sign that God created the world. We have the prophetic message. This is the instrument in the institution that God will use to prepare a people to meet God. It does not mean that when you don't belong to this group, you will not be saved. That's not the message of the remnant. Because the Lord says, I have many sheep in the other fold. But in the last days, they will hear me. And they will follow the ship. The reason why the Lord started His church from the great disappointment, so that our pride will not be in us. Sometimes we boast. You see, our church is this. Our church is like that. Our church, we do this. 
We have Florida Hospital. We have Loma Linda. We have... No. Don't you forget, we came from the great disappointment. It should remind us, just like Israel of old, that when they boast of how they were chosen of the Lord, the Lord says, I have not chosen you because you're a great nation. You are slaves for 400 years. Our pride is not in us. Our pride is that God is guiding us. And God is the one leading us until the end. And because this is how it started and how it will end, God has a special message for us. We're now on part three. The church may appear as it's about to, fa to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. I want you to be very observant with his words. You may think that the church sometimes is about to fall, but because God is in control, it will remain. Who will be sifted out? Those are the sinners. That's why if you are listening to the voice of the servant of the Lord, don't be the one who will fulfill prophecy in going out. The Lord will preserve His people. They will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. Are you worried that even some of our leaders are leaving the church? Even some brilliant minds are leaving the church? The Lord said, the servant of the Lord, this is terrible. But nevertheless, it will take place. Don't be surprised. And it says, let's uh, go back one uh, Quotation, the church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and uh, demoralized by sin. Let me see if we can get it. Yes. The church enfeebled and defective needing to be reproved, warned, and counseled is the only object upon earth upon which Christ bestows His supreme regard. Now, this is not just talking about the church in general. Because it will say, it's not talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. It may be talking about the, what they call invisible church. The church that uh, is constituted from different uh, faithful followers from different denominations. No, Ellen White was saying, I am instructed to say to the Seventh-day Adventists in the world over, God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure unto himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united in the spirit in the counsel of the Lord of hosts to the end time. Is there any part of history where this church will not stand? No, it says until the end time. It's the spirit of the Lord that will unite us. Maybe now we are scattered. Sometimes we have different opinions. Sometimes we have different ideas. But the Spirit of the Lord will bring us together. Because what God started, He will finish it in righteousness. And instead of focusing on some minor problems of the church... This is what God is trying to tell us. What will be our focus for the church, especially that we see that the world is about to end? Have you heard about the warning about possible earthquake that will happen in British Columbia? The Canadian forces are now on alert. 
because uh, there's a big uh, earthquake that they are forecasting somewhere in that place. In the Philippines, the peer box was saying between February 28 to March 4, there will be the big one or a big earthquake that will rock the country. In this, just this week, first Surigao was hit, and then Davao the other day, and then Compostela. Series. And you may say, these are not new. <laughs> We've been hearing that before. Yes, but now you see the natural calamities, the political world. If you will be listening to uh, the newspaper or uh, the TV and read the newspaper, you seldom find good news. It will alarm you. But we, the Lord is telling us, we are living now in the end times. Our focus is not about you against us or some divisions. No. It says here, our focus should be what? First, provoke one another to love and to good works. I, uh, I'm going to announce to you that starting March, we will be launching our community services. I was talking with Brother Harold. He will be conducting how to do simple plumbing so that our people will be trained so that we will not be calling him and again and again when we have problem. All of us will know. But that's not the point. The point is, when there are need in the community, we will be there. We will be training also community members to do this. The communication department is planning to have seminars on how to teach our community how to use the computer, basic computer skills. Because even some of our people, they, they are not uh, conversant into how it, it works. Bro, I was talking with Brother Joseph, and we will be, uh, and uh, also Brother Agdepa, that we will be training our people on how to do uh, chains oil and basic uh, auto uh, maintenance. It's, it's not just for us. It's chains oil. It's not just for us. We will offer this to the community. It says, provoke one another to love in good works. It's now high time for us to serve one another. Dr. Lyson has been saying it must be personal. Everyone should be involved. If your skill is into cooking, use that to serve others. If your uh, skill is into gardening or whatever, let's bring that together to provoke each other into good works. Why? Because there are some that Instead of doing this, the Lord's servant says, God has invested His church with special authority and power which no one can be justified in disregarding and despising. Because in the last days, it was shown to the servant of the Lord that people, instead of working together, they used their time disregarding and despising the voice of the Lord. They focus their attention on the church and say, the church is now an apostate. What's the reason why they are saying that the church is an apostate? What are the reasons why they say the church is now part of Babylon? So that we can get out and join them. What is the message of the Lord? We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into new organization. Have you heard some people preaching in the internet, in the Facebook, and everywhere that says, Time to get out of the Seventh Adventist Church. Join me. If you're reading the spirit of prophecy, you will not be fooled. As the shepherd of the ship 
to represent Jesus here in this congregation, I am worried that even our people are being affected. They keep on saying, Time to leave the church! No! According to the Lord, He will see to it that what He started, He will finish it. The Lord will not spend so much energy establishing this in the church and at the end, it will fail. The Lord will be a failure. That's why Ellen White, as the servant of the Lord says, no time to enter into new organization because this is apostasy from the truth. What he wants us is to assemble and exalt each other. Exhort each other. That's why we have small group Bible studies. Monday we have in Longwood. Tuesday we have in Apopka. Wednesday we have it here. Tuesday, uh, Thursday we have it in, uh, near this church. Friday we have it also in the church. Let's come together. Let's not just be here for the Sabbath, let's assemble and exhort each other so that we can be strengthened and be nurtured in the faith. This is now the warning. I am about to finish. Beware of those who arise with a great burden to denounce the church. Once you hear something, that is so good, and at the middle or at the time at, at the end of the message, it's attacking the church. Beware. Why? How dare mortal man pass his judgment upon them and call the church harlot? And call the church Babylon? And then of thieves? These are familiar words now that we hear. You know, while I'm preparing, I have not prepared a sermon so difficult as this. It took me days of struggle. And when I'm done, my computer almost crashed. I have to bring it to Prince because my, uh, my uh, PowerPoint is not working. And when I was about to print this handout, the printer jumped. The enemy does not want this message because the enemy's task is to attack the church, destroy the church, because he knows once he succeeds in destroying our church, then we will be at peril. So not to denounce the church, not to call the church harlot or Babylon or Dean of Thebes, when anyone is drawing apart from the organized body. What is the organized body? When he begins to weigh the church in his own human scale, begin to pronounce judgments against them, then you may know that God is not leading them. Is this not a very clear statement from the spirit of prophecy? When they start to say that the general conference is the beast, and the Florida Conference is the image of the beast. That is not from the Lord. Then you may know that God is not leading them. He is in the wrong track. The conclusion. God will lead His church until the end. The last here says, I am encouraged and blessed as I realize that the God of Israel is still guiding His people. Don't be discouraged. Enfeeble, or it may seem like it will fall. No, we are just two words. The Lord will take care of His own people. That He will continue to be with them even until 2016. 2020 until the end. I am so happy that the God who gave us this church, the God who granted us the gift of prophecy, promised us that He will not abandon us. 
He will lead us to the end. But the church should lift Jesus. It's not the church that will save us. It's not the church that will bring us into the presence of the Lord. Jesus will. But He is going to use the whole church. So, brothers and sisters, time for us to love each other more. Time for us to exhort and to assemble together, uh, provoke each other to good works because the Lord is about to come. But He is assuring us, once you are faithful to me, I'll take care of you. Brothers and sisters, there may be some discouragements in the past or some questions in our mind before or we may be swayed by some other groups that says we are the true one. But the Lord is showing us if He has done so much for our salvation, He will never abandon us. Be strong in the Lord and appreciate His gift and be a faithful steward. And God will bring us to the fruition of His plan. He will come to take His own and we are part of it. May the Lord bless us all.